Hello there, this is Julian Humphreys and this is How to Capture a Castle, a brief look at castles and siege warfare through the Middle Ages. I'm going to start by looking at the history of castles, how they've developed in this country. It should be said that there were a few castles built before the Norman Conquest in England, particularly along the Welsh marches by Norman settlers, but it's really after 1066 that you see the first great surge in castle building. Hundreds were built at that time throughout the country by the invading Normans um, and they were more than just military, they were also administrative centres and to a certain extent they were status symbols and symbols of, of, of Norman power. Now the bulk of those uh, were what we would call Mott and Bailey castles. There are very few of them, well none are complete now because they, they were built of wood and that has disappeared, but the motts, the mounds on which they were built, are still around. And that's really what they are. They're, they're a wooden tower normally on a mound. That's the mott, a mound of earth. And then around it, a palisade enclosing the bailey. And inside the bailey, you would have had domestic buildings, maybe stables, uh, storerooms and animals, etc. could be brought in in the event of a, of a siege. The drawback of these wooden buildings can be seen quite clearly, actually, in, in, the, in this picture of the Bayer Tapestry. This is um, the siege of Dinan in Brittany, and you can probably see that in the middle it's being set alight to by those two guys on foot. And, uh, of course, that is your, your big problem. If you're building wood, uh, you are vulnerable to fire. And so in the 12th century, you get a gradual replacement of wooden castles by stone castles big castle building period the 12th century there were an awful lot of sieges at the time particularly in the anarchy the wars between Stephen and Matilda in the middle of, of that century and actually uh, many of those keeps that we think of as being archetypally Norman so I've got here for example uh, the keep at Rochester they were built in in this period in fact many of them were built by um, by Henry the first and Henry the second uh, in the first half of the of the of the 12th century so a much more powerful much much more defensible of course than the the wooden towers of a century before but the big drawback with them really is that there's no opportunity for an active defense all you can really do is to sort of get in them close the door and hope that the enemy go away or that somebody comes along to to relieve you and so in the 13th century you begin to see a change from that towards castles with the possibilities of much more active defence. Now this is um, Gaedelon which is that castle that's being built in Burgundy from scratch using medieval techniques uh, and it's based upon a castle that might have been built by Philip Augustus of France and you can probably see that now the defences are all on the outer wall. You've got lots of towers around there, round towers that will deflect missiles, etc., but also give a better field of fire for the archers and crossbowmen. And they can also enfilade. In other words, they can shoot him from the flanks on anybody trying to get over the walls. Now, as the 13th century went on, you saw the development, the gradual development of concentric castles. That's where you've got lines of defence, one inside another. So I've got this picture of Dover here and you can see right in the middle, the Great Tower of Dover. Around it then there's a lower wall and then beyond that there's a third, much more extensive wall. And what it meant was that an attacker could be shot at from more than one wall at once and if they manage to get through the outer wall, they're trapped in a sort of killing zone uh, with a stone wall behind them and another wall to deal with in front. Now Dover developed in a somewhat piecemeal manner with bits being added over the ages, but by the end of the 13th century you start to get concentric castles being built from scratch. And a classic example is Beaumaris on the Isle of Anglesey, and you can see there how you've got the inner walls with the towers all round it and then a lower wall outside it and then a moat and in fact a third wall was started but like the rest of the castle it was never completely finished. Fast forward to the 14th century and you see something of a change and you start to see castles being built really as much as status symbols and comfortable places in which to entertain as anything else. This is the great tower it's probably a mistake to call it a keep at Walkworth really imposing building inside the walls but look at the windows on it you can see that they're large to let in a lot of light they're hardly defensible and indeed Walkworth's great tower is as much about 
entertaining and living comfortably as it is about defence. Then you've got Bodium down in Sussex. Well, it's the picture book castle, isn't it? With its towers, its regular towers and its beautiful lake or moat around it. Again, this is as much about status and looking good as anything else. And the chap that built it, a chap called Dallingridge, had made his money in the Hundred Years' War and had gone up the social order. Well, what do knights and earls and lords have? They have castles. So he wanted one, so he built it. But once again, look at the large windows on the outside. And many of the defences, like the machiculations, which are the galleries, the stone galleries, uh, over the gate there. If you dropped anything through them, they simply plop down into the water, which is evidence, I think, that this is really as much about show as anything else. So there's one change that castles are being built very much for show, but there's another big change uh, at the end of the 14th century, and that's the advent of gunpowder. Of course, this is a big game changer. Now, this gun port that you can see here is actually just up the road from God's House Tower, overlooking Western Arcade in Southampton. And it was where a handgun really could be poked out and shot at people. So we've now got gunpowder changing the way that warfare is, is fought. It will take a while, but it's having an impact. Uh, even so, these uh, g guns are primarily, I suppose, anti-personnel weapons. And they could be incorporated into the more traditional defences of a, a castle. So look at this gatehouse at Carisbrook, for example. So you've got the projecting gallery, the machiculations where unpleasant trees can be dropped down on attackers. You've got crossbow loops, the crosses of crossbow loops. You've got arrow slits, you've got crenellations. But you've also got a line of keyhole shaped gun loops. So here they are being incorporated into um, a medieval castle. But... As time goes on and you get much bigger guns, these are bombards that were left behind by the uh, English after an unsuccessful siege of Mont Saint-Michel in the 15th century. These are the real game changer because these mighty weapons could make short work of a castle wall with the large stone and sometimes iron balls that they, they could shoot. Once this happens, the days of the traditional castle with its tall walls and its towers etc etc are numbered because they just can't stand up to this kind of thing and so you get a big change in the way that fortifications are built this is south sea castle um, and as you can see it's got a much lower profile now gone are those high walls gone are the towers it's a much squatter building so it's less of a target and also the walls are lower they're thicker so they're able to resist artillery uh, but they're also able to mount guns. Not that they would have stood a chance against that ship that's sailing past in the picture, but that's by the by. OK, well, we've looked at the development of castles through the Middle Ages. Uh, let's have a look now at how you might capture one. Well, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that siege warfare or attacking a castle is extremely costly. It's costly in terms of money, if you've got to pay troops to sit around besieging a castle. It's costly in terms of lives. It's costly in terms of time. And, you know, a whole campaign could grind to a halt if you had to have to stop and uh, attack a castle. And so I would say that, that, that if you really want to capture a castle, the best thing to do, first of all, is to ask nicely. See if you can persuade the defenders to surrender it. And there's a number of ways that this was achieved in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. One was through diplomacy, you know, by a marriage to somebody you might be able to acquire a castle um, another way uh, might be um, through a treaty and a good example of this was in the 12th century the English managed to get hold of Berwick, Jebra, Edinburgh and Stirling castles mighty Scottish castles as part of a peace treaty after the English had defeated and captured William the Lion of Scotland at Annick part of the deal was that in order for him to be returned to his kingdom, he had to hand over the uh, the castles. Bribery. So, for example, when uh, Louis of France invaded England at the time of the Magna Carta Wars in the early 13th century, he wanted to get hold of Dover Castle and he offered Hubert de Burr, who was the defender of the castle, uh, Norfolk and Suffolk in exchange for the castle. Another example of, um, of, of this kind of thing is that when Margaret of Anjou... Um, the wife of Henry VI, wanted Scottish support during the Wars of the Roses in, in 1460. She actually gave them Carlisle in exchange for that support. 
or you could try trickery. And a good example of this was at the end of the 13th century when Crack de Chevalier, that very famous castle out in the in the Holy Land, uh, was captured by the Mamelukes. Um, they got hold of it by actually producing a forged letter which they gave to the defenders, the Hospitallers, and it was from the head of the Order of the Hospitallers instructing them to surrender. So there you've got sort of trickery as a way of getting in. Just a word about this picture that I've put up here. Uh, I find it quite amusing, really, because our view, I think, of the Crusades is it's very much Richard the Lionheart who takes the lead in it all, etc. This is a French illustration showing the uh, the capture of Acre. And what you can see, actually, are the people in Acre handing the keys of the city over to Philip Augustus of France. And the rather sickly looking bloke that's looking on, that's a French version of Richard the Lionheart. Now, you could up the ante by... Um, using religion. Well, of course, religion was so important in the in the Middle Ages, and it even was on the battlefield. It was quite a force multiplier because the thought of salvation or, or going to heaven if you went on a crusade or the fact that you had um, a priest with you uh, confessing your sins or, or whatever it might be actually added to people's confidence. But you could actually use religion as a weapon. Uh, this is a picture of um, the capture of Jerusalem, and you can see priests at the front they're urging everybody on uh, but you could also use your priests to destroy the morale of the opposition and a great example of this or a great example of an attempt to do this was the siege of Kenilworth in in 1266. Now Kenilworth um, was one of the last strongholds of Simon de Montfort's rebels against Henry III and it held out really for better terms I think of surrender than anything else but anyway it was held there it was Kenilworth with the, its defenders in it and Henry III turned up um, and he brought with him actually the Archbishop of Canterbury and the papal legate and so in a bid to undermine the will of the defenders to carry on fighting he got the Archbishop of, La of, uh, of Canterbury and the legate to formally excommunicate all the defenders in other words deny them the sacraments well, this was a pretty serious thing in the Middle Ages, because if you died without those sacraments, you kind of went to the hot place. And so they were thinking was that people would maybe not be quite so keen to carry on in these circumstances. But actually, the guy who was in, in charge of, uh, of Kenilworth, uh, a chap called Hastings, he was made of sterner stuff than this. And he decided the best thing to do was to pour scorn on it and take the mickey out of it. And according to one of the chroniclers, he got the castle barber dressed him up in a sheet, made a kind of mitre for his head, gave him a shepherd's crook and stuck him up on the battlements. And this guy excommunicated Henry III, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, the papal legate and the entire royal army. So obviously that guy understood uh, psychological warfare quite well. But what about if you summon a castle, you try and persuade it to surrender by all the methods that I've said, but the defenders won't play ball. What if they're not going to surrender and you're going to have to take it by violence? Well, what you could do is you could summon it formally. So you could go along and you could say along the lines of, you know, surrender now and we will reward you. Fail to surrender. And when we get in, we'll take your lives or things to that effect. Or you could simply try a surprise attack. Now, Robert the Bruce was excellent at this. And in the early... 14th century. He captured a lot of English held castles by surprise attack. Linlithgow is an example of that where it was held by the English and Robert the Bruce, it's full Robin Hood stuff this, he hid a load of soldiers in a hay cart which went up to the gates as though it was delivering something. They opened up the gates, it went halfway through the gates and then stopped so they couldn't shut the gates and then all these guys jumped out of the hay and they captured the castle. On uh, another uh, time, Roxburgh, at Roxburgh, his men crept up under blankets uh, at night and sneaked up to the walls in that way. And one of the chroniclers said that the English saw them but thought that it was a herd of cows out there. Uh, the English were quite adept at this as well. During the Hundred Years' War in 1437, they captured Pontoise in France. It, well, it was a very snowy day. There was quite a blizzard and there were lots of snow. And they crept up to the walls with sheets on them to camouflage themselves. But well, obviously, you know, when you get up to the to the castle, if you can't get in, like at Linlithgow through the gates, you're going to have to scale the walls. And you can see in this picture, 
this going on. You can see there's two guys on the right going up their ladders. And then over on the left, you've got archers trying to keep the heads down of the defenders so they can't push the ladders back or what have you. Um, obviously, the guys that are going up those ladders, if the enemy are ready for them, they're horribly exposed, aren't they? Because, you know, they can have all manner of missiles rain down on them, arrows, crossbows, also things like boiling hot sand, uh, blinding lime, etc. So, you know, this was a risky move uh, at storming in this way. One thing you might do, rather than here where you've got the two guys going up the ladder in the same place, you might try and attack the walls in different places and that way get in. But no cover. So if you wanted to do this more formally, you might build a belfry or a siege tower. This picture here shows um, the siege of Lisbon in the mid-12th century. And you can see what a siege tower is. It's an enormous great wooden tower, which would be filled with men that would climb up the ladders on the back of it. And then it would be painstakingly dragged up to the castle or city walls. And when it got there, up on the top, whilst people on the top shot down into the city and onto the battlements, a drawbridge would be lowered and then people would storm across the drawbridge onto the walls and that they would then that way they would get into the uh, the castle uh there are problems though the first thing is it's painfully slow and consequently the defenders knew when it where it was going they could see it coming towards them so they had time to prepare for the attack so obviously if they had catapults and missile throwers they'd rain stones and fire if they could at the at the siege tower Again, at the siege of Kenilworth, uh, Henry III's uh, army had a great big siege tower called the Bear. But the defenders had a catapult. Some of the stones are still there, actually, in the, uh, in the castle. And they were able to destroy the Bear before it could be brought up to the wall. Um, other things that the defenders could do, well, they could uh, actually make their wall higher. They could see where the siege tower was going to arrive. It's not it couldn't really change direction very quickly. So they could simply build their wall up so that it was higher than the siege tower. And on one occasion, the Byzantines actually got hold of a great big ship's mast and they used it to jam the drawbridge shut so it couldn't be lowered. Another obstacle that the attackers might have to deal with was the fact that a castle or a town wall might be surrounded by a ditch. Well, if it was filled with water, you've got real problems. But even if it didn't, you can see how it would make life difficult for one of those towers. It would simply topple over. So before you could even launch your siege tower against the wall, you had to fill in the ditch, which once again gave the defenders a good idea of where the siege tower was going to arrive. But, you know, just actually having to go up there under fire, you know, under arrow fire, etc., to fill the ditch was a difficult job in itself. And in the siege of, of Jerusalem, it, it said that um, the any soldier that threw three stones into the ditch was rewarded with a penny. I don't know what size the stones were. <laughs> I'd, I'd have just lobbed a few pebbles in, but I imagine they meant something much larger than that. Nevertheless, these things um, could be used successfully. When the Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099, they used siege towers to get across. The one in this picture, it looks huge, doesn't it? But actually, they, they could be very large. Uh, the one that the English built at the Siege of Lisbon um, in 1147, it was at 95 feet high. OK, so, so far we've been talking about going over the walls. But if you can't go over the walls, the other option, of course, is to go through them. And the main way that you can do that is by creating some kind of breach in the wall. Well, you could attempt to do this with a battering ram. Um, it could be a large affair like the one that I've illustrated here. And clearly, by repeatedly banging the ram part against the wall, you eventually create a, uh, a crack and then, all being well, the, the wall falls down. Um, you can see it's got a, a, a kind of sloping roof on it. They called it a penthouse. Uh, that was to deflect whatever the defenders could throw down upon it. But they weren't always very easy to operate against a castle for a number of reasons. One of the big problems was that you needed to have the space to deploy them. Uh, if, for example, the castle had a slope leading up to it, they were quite difficult to use. Uh, 
And also, quite a lot of castles, the approach to the gate, which was probably the weakest place and the place where a ram like this could be used, instead of running up to the gate, it ran parallel to the wall, which of course made life very difficult. So rams, I think, were more effective when they were used on a kind of smaller scale, maybe to batter down the doors of a, of a smaller property or a small fortified residence. So instead of going up to the wall and trying to batter it down from close quarters, the other obvious thing to do was to use missile weapons to bombard a wall to knock it down in that way. Now, these were clearly used in lots of sieges, but exactly what they were is a bit difficult to tell. And the reason for this is that the chroniclers at the time were never very precise about exactly what they were talking about. So they often described all these things as simply engines, or they might say that they were petrarii. In other words, a Latin word meaning a stone thrower. So exactly what kind of petraria it was is not clear. However, essentially, there were three types of missile throwing weapons and they worked on tension, torsion and leverage respectively. Well, the main type of tension weapon was a version of the Roman baluster. It was often called a springhold. And I think, as you can see, it was basically a giant crossbow that could shoot bolts or launch stones at the enemy. Now, the defenders often had them as well. Look at the detail on this 14th century charter from Carlisle. And it shows on the left, you can see some Scots with a catapult and they're being shot at by one of these spring olds from the walls. And in fact, one of the Scots has been pierced by a fairly wicked looking arrow, hasn't he? Coming on to torsion. Well, the best known torsion weapon was the mangonel or the onager. And it used twisted ropes to force a throwing arm forward. Uh, it's significant, though, that I've had to use a later illustration here because I've never seen a contemporary illustration of one. They're never shown in medieval manuscripts, illuminated manuscripts or, or pictures. And why this is, we don't know. Maybe they were too difficult to draw. Maybe they preferred to show the trebuchets that I'll talk about a bit later. Or maybe they weren't actually used at all. It's just a mystery. We, we don't know. But as you can see, how it would work is it, it would simply use those twisted ropes to hurl a stone forward at the walls. And then finally, we come to leverage and the trebuchet. Now that worked by having a throwing arm that was balanced on a beam. And when one end went down, it shot the other end up and that released the missile. Now, initially, these were shot and operated manually. And if you look at the picture that I've got here, you'll see that there are three ropes coming down from the end of the throwing arm. In reality, there could be up to 200, 250 men on these ropes. And they would all pull at the same time and then their end would go down and then the stone would go up into the air and all being well, the guy that had loaded it had let go of the sling, not like the guy in this picture. Things could actually go quite badly wrong. Um, at Wark in 1174, uh, the Scots had invaded England and they built their first ever trebuchet. And they set it up outside of Wark and everybody got ready and they all pulled the, uh, the, the ropes and the stone went straight up into the air and came down and squashed a Scotsman. Now, it was eventually realised that it could be equally effective to use a counterweight instead of muscle power. And if you look at this illustration, you can see that there's a box in the trebuchet and that would have been filled with stones and lead. And if it was heavy enough, it could create quite a lot of force. And it's known that, for example, a hundred pound ball could be lobbed 300 yards. That's quite an important distance because it meant that the machine could be out of the range of the defender's archers in the castle. Now, these were big devices and they were given dramatic names. So when Louis of France besieged Dover Castle in 1216, he brought one along that was called Malvoisin, or Bad Neighbour. Edward I, at the beginning of the 14th century, he had one that was called War Wolf. And uh, when he laid siege to Stirling in 1305, it took 55 men three months to build it. Interestingly, they just finished building it and they were all getting ready to shoot it at Stirling when the castle surrendered. Apparently, Edward said, no, 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 you're not going to surrender yet. I want to try out War Wolf. And so he wouldn't let them surrender until he'd bashed down one of the walls with War Wolf. And you think, well, that's a bit of a daft thing to do because then he'd have a repair bill immediately to put back the damage that he'd done. But I think he was perhaps trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of his weapon. 
so that other castles would be more prone to surrender quickly. I think that's what it was about. I should say that it wasn't just stones that got shot into castles. Um, in 1422, for example, Prince Corbett of Lithuania was besieging uh, Karolstein, the town of Karolstein, and in a bid to spread disease amongst the defenders, he had 2,000 cartloads of excrement shot into the town. Or you could seek to undermine the morale of the defenders by firing in the severed heads of prisoners. And then, as you can see in this picture, sometimes you could be making a quite specific point. During the siege of Oberosch in 1340, it was an English town that was held in, in, in France. It was under siege by the French and the English sent a messenger out to try and get help. But the French caught him and they pinned the message to his chest and they shot him back into the castle uh, by a trebuchet. Having said all that, it does seem that most castles were built to take a lot of punishment. It's only when you get gunpowder that the walls are really vulnerable. And whilst these trebuchets are used at a lot of sieges, you know, Stirling is perhaps the exception. More often than not, the walls are able to stand up to the bombardment. But of course, these stones are going to go over the walls and inside the castle, you might have stables, storerooms, people going around, etc. And so these great rocks and stones landing amongst them could cause all kinds of damage and misery. So if you were really wanted to be certain about bringing down a castle wall, the way to do it was to undermine it. Now, you could just hack away at the base of the wall like these two are doing in, in this picture, but obviously they're vulnerable to whatever the defenders can throw at them or to sorties from the castle where people might come out to try and deal with them. And so a more favoured method, if the ground wasn't too hard or too wet, was to dig a tunnel under the wall. So you'd go under the wall and you'd undermine it and then you prop up the wall so that it would only fall down when you want it to. And you prop it up with pit props. And then you'd, at the time that you needed, you set a light to those pit props. The wall then would, of course, have no support and it would come crashing down. Now, some of these tunnels still survive, in fact, um, at Dover and, uh, and here at St Andrews. And you can actually go down them. Uh, sometimes, incidentally, the um, attackers would actually invite the enemy commanders to come out and inspect the mines that they dug, the tunnels that they dug. Why would they do this? Well, because not everybody was like Edward I. Not everybody was prepared to damage a castle unnecessarily. And so if they could spare themselves a, a, a hefty repair bill, they would do so. So they might take out a, a, a defending commander and say, look, we've undermined your wall. Um, it, you, your days are numbered now. If you surrender now, we'll let you go free, etc. But if you force us to destroy the wall, uh, your life is going to be forfeit. Now, a really good example of a use of a mine in this way was in 1215 in the Siege of Rochester. It was holding out against King John during the Barons' Wars. Now, King John was able to get into the Outer Bailey, but the keep at Rochester held out against him. So he got his miners to undermine a corner of the, of the keep. They duly propped up the cavity and they piled up brushwood around um, the pit props. And then when all of his troops were ready to attack, they set a light to the brushwood, thinking that the pit props would then burn and the wall would collapse. The trouble was there wasn't much air down there and they couldn't get the fire going. Uh, but John, actually, on, on this occasion, he was he was quite inventive because he's recorded as having ordered 40 pigs of the type least good for eating. And he got the fat from these pigs and he had it smeared all down there amongst the brushwood. So that when they set it to a light, of course, all this fat started to burn quite, quite ferociously. And that got the fire going. And then, of course, it transmitted to the pit props. I often think about the defenders upstairs, you know, in the castle. Ooh, I could smell bacon. And then the next minute, half their castle falls down. When you look at Rochester, actually, you can see where this happened. Because after it had been captured, it had to be rebuilt. And if you look at the turrets on the outside of the castle, you'll see that... Um, Three of them are square, but one in the corner is round, and that was the one that was rebuilt. You can see it quite clearly in this picture, because when they did the rebuilding, styles had changed and they moved away from square towers, which were more vulnerable because 
they had limited fields of fire and you could knock off the corners to round towers which were better able to deflect missiles and also they gave you a better view out of them. Now the French tried a similar undermining tactic at, at Dover uh, where they wanted to get in through the gatehouse. Now I think at, at Dover the defenders clearly knew something was up because the French had to dig through chalk and you know if you were up on the battlements and you saw all these piles of chalk suddenly appearing everywhere. It was pretty clear what was going on. And you could also, to a certain extent, work out exactly where the attackers were digging by putting bowls of water along the battlements and looking at the ripples. And more ripples was it evidence that there was digging and vibrations underground. Anyway, the French completed their tunnel and in fact you can still see bits of it today if you go to, to Dover. They set fire to their mine, the towers duly collapsed, but the defenders, as I say, they, they knew what was going on and they were ready. And what they'd done was they'd built a second emergency wall, a sort of barricade, really, out of timbers, etc. And that was just inside the, the castle gates. And they were able to hold the French attack and then eventually drive them back. And the castle never fell. Although assaults like this attract most attention, the commonest way to capture a castle was simply to besiege it. Now, siege comes from the French word to seat, and that explains really what you did. You sat down around a castle and you either slowly destroyed it or more often than not, you forced it to surrender because its supplies ran out. Well, we think about starvation, but more desperate than that was when water ran out and a number of castles had to surrender because their wells weren't ran dry. Uh, but starvation could be a real problem. And a good example of this was when Henry V laid siege to Rouen in 1419-1420. Now the French were running out of food but they didn't want to surrender because they were convinced that a relieving army was going to come and, and rescue them so they wouldn't surrender and they ended up, um, it's recorded that they ended up eating rats and mice and cats and dogs and really anything until eventually you know when the last mouse had been consumed they were forced to give in. A similar thing happened a little earlier in 1347 after the English victory at Crecy, when Edward III was besieging Calais, and it held out for much longer than he wanted it to, really, and um, it was only when it ran out of supplies that it surrendered, and Edward wasn't in a merciful mood, and he actually was all set to execute the leading burghers of Calais, and you can see it here in this Rodin uh, statue, or this Rodin sculpture, of the burghers of Calais coming out to meet their fate, but in fact, his wife intervened and he ultimately spared them. But it's a kind of reminder, I think, that more often than not, it was the local people that suffered most in these things. It wasn't really the knights and the soldiers. It was the innocent civilians. And in fact, if the attacking commander was ruthless enough, he could actually use the local civilians as a, as a weapon. And a real grim example of this is the siege of Chateau Gaillard. Now, Chateau Gaillard, it meant saucy castle. And it may have been saucy, but it was also an incredibly powerful castle, which Richard the Lionheart built on the borders of Normandy to protect his duchy. But in 1203, 1204, Philip Augustus of France mounted a major campaign to overrun Normandy. And to do so, he needed to capture Chateau Gaillard. Now, just below Chateau Gaillard, you can see it in this picture, was a little town. It was called Petit Andelis. And the population of the local town, well, they didn't see themselves as French. They saw themselves as Normans. And many of them might have, might have been married to people in the garrison. They certainly were servants. They worked for the garrison, etc. And so when uh, Philip Augustus's French army turned up, what did they do? Well, they took refuge in the castle. But this was a real problem for Roger de Lacy, who was the governor of the castle because he had plenty of food for his garrison but 1400 extra mouths to feed started to eat up his supplies and they, were, they had a, a term for people like this people that didn't really do any fighting but needed feeding and they called them rather cynically really useless mouths. Now after a while uh, Roger de Lacy thought well I can't keep feeding these people you know we're just going to run out of supplies too quickly so he evicted 500 of them he kicked them out of the castle anyway the French were relatively merciful and they let them through their lines and let them disperse to wherever 
But when Philip Augustus turned up at the siege, he realised he could use these people in the castle to weaken the defenders by getting them to um, eat up the eat up the supplies more quickly. So when the next lot of useless mouths were evicted from the castle, uh, the French wouldn't let them pass and they actually shot at them. So these poor people, these poor civilians, etc., you know, the old, the weak, the sick, women, children, etc. They were driven back from the French line, so thought we'd better get back into the castle. When they got back, the castle gates had been shut and the castle wouldn't let them in either. So they were stuck in this terrible situation in no man's land and essentially they starved there. And in the end, when Philip Augustus did take pity on them and brought them through and actually gave them a meal, they was, they'd starved so much that their stomachs couldn't cope with the... Uh, the mills and many of them died anyway but I think it's a, a, a kind of reminder that that while castles and knights in armour and siege towers and archers etc it's all very romantic but there's always a price to be paid in war and then I think as the case is now that price was highest always for the innocent population. <laughs>